Hello comrades, it's the Finnish Bolshevik. This is another video on the development of philosophy in the USSR, and it's a continuation in a series. More particularly, it's a continuation to the previous episode, which was the uh, mechanism versus dialectics debate. So in the description, I will put a playlist with all the episodes so you can find them. And before you watch this one, I recommend you watch the previous one. But anyway, let's get right into it. History of philosophy in the USSR, the debate on Menshevizing idealism, 1930. Less than a year after the condemnation of mechanism by the dialectical school headed by de Borin, the de Borin school itself came under severe criticism. They were accused of Menshevizing idealism, or idealistic mistakes and slipping towards Menshevik positions. In his book, Soviet Philosophy, A Study of Theory and Practice, which I actually recommend, it's a good read, Somerville writes the following, quote, In point of fact, it was before the first controversy had ended, while de Borin and his followers, during its closing years, were definitely gaining the upper hand, that a feeling arose among a large group of thinkers that neither of the contending schools, that is, mechanists or de Borin's group of dialecticians, was working out the kind of philosophic program and structure that were really needed. The feeling was that de Borin and those who fought with him had performed a necessary and valuable service in contending against the mechanists and exposing their errors, but that their own philosophical outlook suffered from grave defects. They had lost touch with the very rapidly and indeed momentously developing social and economic situation of the whole Soviet experiment, particularly the problems centering around the introduction of the first five-year plan and the building up of the collective farm movement. This area of problems found little reflection in the work of de Borin and his group, any more than in the work of the mechanists. Hence arose the charge of the divorcement of theory from practice. It was the intention to accuse de Borin not so much of outright, full-fledged adherence to Menshevism, but of a tendency, inclination or movement in that direction. It was as much as to say, if he is not a Menshevik, he is at least talking like a Menshevik. He is Menshevizing. And if we do not stop him, he will become, once again, a complete Menshevik. Before the revolution, he had been, in fact, a genuine Menshevik. Philosophically, this meant an adherence to the views of Plehanov, the intellectual leader of the Menshevik faction, rather than those of Lenin, the leader of the Bolsheviks. It meant the belief that Plehanov was the guiding philosopher of the movement rather than Lenin. Unquote. Now, let's look at these various points of contention in greater detail. Firstly, the topic of theory and practice. In order to rectify the errors of de Borin, a Marxist-Leninist group of philosophers emerged. Quote, the character of the group, which rose up in opposition to de Borin, emphasized the social and political contribution which they felt the philosophy ought to make to the currently developing reality. They were rather strict Leninists and inclined to show a little leniency towards the shortcomings of Plehanov. Among their leading figures were Mitin and Yudin. It was de Borin's lack of sharp orientation in the social and political sense that made Mitin accuse him of idealistic tendencies that is, tendencies to deal with ideas apart from their connections with things. We noted at the outset that one of the principal objections made to the work of de Borin and his followers was that they allowed theory to become divorced from practice. To understand this charge, we must go back to the event which had originally set the ball of controversy rolling. This event was the now famous speech delivered by Stalin at the Conference of Agrarian Marxists. This conference took place in December 1929, in the midst of the titanic struggles to collectivize the land. In the course of his talk, which was mainly devoted to theoretical questions, or rather to the relation between certain theories and certain matters of practice, Stalin took occasion to make the remark which became so well known and played such a large part in philosophical discussion. Unquote. Stalin said, and I recommend that people read this talk in its entirety, I'll put a link in the description. Quote, but if we have reason to be proud of our practical successes in the field of socialist construction, it is quite impossible to say the same about our theoretical work in the field of economics in general, and in rural economy in particular. More than that, it is necessary to recognize that our theoretical work is not keeping up with our practical successes that there is a gap between practical achievements and the development of theory, 
Meanwhile, what is necessary is that theoretical work should not only keep pace with the practical, but should move in advance of it, arming the practitioners in their struggle for the victory of socialism. Unquote. Somerville writes, quote, What this meant in reality was the relation of philosophical work to the great practical problems. Unquote. And Gustav Vedder writes, quote, In this speech, Stalin was severely critical of a number of theories at that time current in Soviet cultural life, for instance, the mechanist theories of equilibrium and samotek. Unquote. And for a more fuller description of those, I recommend you check the previous episode. But basically, the equilibrium theory was Buharin's mechanistic distortion of dialectics, which he took from the revisionist Bogdanov, and Samotek was another mechanistic theory which implied that everything would basically develop spontaneously or automatically, inevitably, regardless of uh, any kind of conscious action by the communists or the proletariat. It's a one-sided theory that doesn't understand that, yes, while history does progress because of material factors and not because of people's ideas, quite often, and even more so in the case of the proletariat and in a socialist society, the material factors take the form of conscious action by people. This is why Marx said that ideas, or, quote, theory, also becomes a material force as soon as it has gripped the masses, unquote. Somerville continues, quote, It was the opinion of Mitten and his group that neither the Deborinites nor the Mechanists understood the gravity of the social situation. Both were insensitive to their philosophic obligations in the face of it. They were not doing their part to find the laws of the transitional period, that is, the transition from NEP to socialism. It was that situation around which, as Mitten felt, the philosophic work should mainly revolve whereas the Deborinites were principally preoccupied with problems of interpreting the history of philosophy. Meanwhile, in regard to sociological matters, it was Buharin's theories which by default, as one might say, were left to stand in the field. It was such conditions that gave rise to Mitten's charge of divorcement of theory from practice and scholasticism on the part of the Deborin group. The issues were discussed at length in a philosophical conference which met for three days in October 1930. Everyone concerned presented his views. Among the leading speakers, on one side were Mitin and Yudin, and on the other, Deborin, Karev, and Sten. The closing stages of the discussion were marked by Deborin's admission that his leadership had been faulty, and that he had not carried out his philosophic obligations in the face of the very serious social problems confronting the people. The consensus of opinion was that philosophic work should proceed along the lines indicated by Mitin's group. Unquote couple remarks. It's pretty easy to see why Mitin and Yudin felt that the Deboring group were kind of out of touch with reality and uh, had separated philosophy and theory from political practice. Their work wasn't really contributing much to the immediate practical aims of the government. That's why they were called scholastics. Scholasticism was a medieval philosophy. It was a medieval Christian type of Aristotelianism, and this kind of pejorative view of the scholastics was that they were just thinking about questions like what's the nature of God or how many angels can stand on the tip of a needle or basically pointless questions that have nothing to do with real life. It's important to note that the Deboring group was to a large extent correct when it came to philosophy because they advocated dialectics, but because they had separated theory from practice and they focused exclusively on philosophy and even the history of philosophy, which, as I explained in the previous episode, is not entirely wrong, like the debate on Hegel, the debate on Spinoza. In many ways, that was a worthwhile discussion, but because they focused exclusively on those kinds of things, as a result, even though the mechanist school of philosophers had been condemned and criticized and marginalized, mechanistic theories were still very influential and basically running rampant in political life because the De Boring group had done nothing to replace them. They hadn't provided anything that could replace the mechanistic political theories. They had only defeated mechanism on very broad philosophical topics. But there is also a difference between the mechanist group and the De Boring group. First of all, the De Boring group, after they were criticized, they accepted the criticism and they also made a good self-criticism and tried to correct their views much more than many of the mechanists had.
But let's continue. Vetter writes, quote, On 25th of January 1931, in its resolution concerning the journal Podsnamenem Marxisma, or under the banner of Marxism, the Central Committee of the Party condemned both mechanism and deborinism and demanded of the new philosophical leadership a war on two fronts in philosophy also. In the field of philosophy, the journal must wage a relentless struggle on two fronts against the mechanist revision of Marxism as the chief danger at the present time, and also against the idealist distortion of Marxism on the part of comrades de Borin, Karev, Steen, and others. The de Borinists were accused, above all, of having separated philosophy from politics, theory from practice. They were rebuked for not having understood that Leninism represents a new epoch in philosophy, a reproach directed at their high opinion of Plehanov. All the same, it is noteworthy that it was mechanism which was described as the chief danger at the present time. Unquote. And in many ways, de Borin was actually blamed for not having criticized mechanism well enough. Quote, Lenin had prescribed a critical attitude towards the Hegelian dialectic and called for it to be reformed on materialist lines and applied to the concrete reality of the proletarian struggle for existence. De Borin, however, had done neither the one nor the other. In the first place, the de Borinists had taken over the Hegelian dialectic as it stood, without transforming it into a materialist dialectic. They had supposed that in Hegel's philosophy it was only the system that was idealistic, the method itself being a materialist one. In addition to their unmodified acceptance of the Hegelian dialectic, the de Borinists had committed a further error in taking an entirely abstract view of the dialectic, without applying it to the concrete problems of Soviet reality. Their whole activity had been occupied almost exclusively with Hegel's science of logic, without taking any account of the questions of the day, the problems of politics and economics, the dictatorship of the proletariat, and its struggle for the establishment of socialism. For them, it was only the dialectic of logic that counted, not the dialectic of reality and the social struggle. But it was not only in this Hegelian conception of dialectic that the idealism of the de Borinists presented itself. Their conception of matter is almost equally erroneous. They banish from it, indeed, everything which constitutes, in the Leninist view, the essential nature of matter, namely its character as an objective reality independent of our consciousness, which gives rise to our sensations. The nature of matter in this sense is misrepresented in the definition given by de Borin, whose book, Lenin the Thinker, begins by framing the concept of matter correctly enough, but then goes on to say, in the broader sense, matter is the whole infinite concrete totality of mediations, that is, ties and relationships, unquote. So, like I talked about in the previous episode, the mechanists wanted to pretty much get rid of Hegel entirely, but the de Borinists, on the other hand, they didn't see any problems in Hegel that had to be corrected. They didn't understand that the Hegelian dialectic was not the same as the Marxist dialectic. It wasn't just that Hegel's philosophical system was idealist, but his method was also idealist, although his method contained that rational kernel which actually ran into a contradiction with Hegel's idealistic system and which Marx then had to further develop into a materialist dialectic. Vedder says further, quote, Under de Borin's direction, the Hegelianizing of Marxism had reached such a point that for three or four years, the whole work of the philosophical section of the Institute of Red Professors had been devoted to Hegel's logic, and the last three or four courses had given no opportunity even for making acquaintance with the work of Feuerbach, let alone that of Marx and Engels. Unquote. All right, now let's talk about Plehanov. Plehanov was the founder of Marxism in Russia. He started the first Marxist organization, the Emancipation of Labor Group, in the 1880s. He collaborated with Lenin until, during the split between Bolsheviks and Mensheviks, he initially took a pro-Bolshevik or a neutral stance, but eventually slipped into Menshevism. And then, with some back and forth, during World War I, he basically uh, adopted an opportunist position. As a result, he was seen in a very mixed way by the Bolsheviks. On the one hand, he was one of the leaders of Russian Marxism. He was one of the biggest theoreticians. Some of his work was considered classic, but also he had become an opportunist. The de Boring group was seriously criticized for their view on Lenin and Plehanov. They held the view, which was actually widespread among ex-Mensheviks, that Plehanov had been the real theoretician, while Lenin had only been a practical leader. 
this may seem like a weird position because we're so used to thinking of Lenin as a great theoretician, but back then, especially among people who had been Mensheviks most of their career, they did not see it that way. So the Deborinists did not understand that Leninism was actually a higher stage of Marxism. They also did not see any flaws in Plehanov's theory and did not see any meaningful disagreement between Lenin and Plehanov in theory. In reality, Plehanov was a great theoretician, but he also made many serious mistakes. Most of all in practical politics, but also in theory. It should be stated that, to his credit, after the controversy, Deborin did his best to correct his mistakes and made a thorough self-criticism. And there were a lot of criticisms, but they were fruitful criticisms in the end. I will now read what Deborin said in 1937, when he had uh, already self-criticized years before. Quote, to speak concretely, let me cite my earlier views on the relation of Lenin and Plehanov. A number of years ago, I used to be of the opinion, as my published writings show, that Lenin was our great political leader, while Plehanov was our great philosophic leader. I now see that this whole view of the situation sprang out of a false conception of the relation of theory and practice. I now see that Lenin was not only our political leader, but our theoretical leader as well as a theoretician greater by far than Plehanov. Take, for instance, Lenin's whole theory of imperialism. Plehanov never worked out any comparable doctrine of the basic aspects of present-day capitalism. Then take Lenin's theory of the state, the whole concept of the Soviet state, which was of such critical importance in the building of socialism. It was Lenin who rose to that occasion in 1917 and not Plehanov. Again, it was Lenin and not Plehanov who understood the nature of the imperialist war, and who consequently never wavered in his attitude towards it, whereas Plehanov completely lost his bearings and adopted a chauvinist position. Unquote. Vedder writes, quote, Deborin had taken Plehanov, the theoretician, as a compliment to Lenin, the man of action. He had constituted himself the uncritical apologist of Plehanov's entire oeuvre. Unquote. This is what Somerville writes. Quote, Long before the revolution, Deborin's book, An Introduction to the Philosophy of Dialectical Materialism, had appeared with a friendly preface by Plehanov, which was in great contrast to the remarks which Lenin penned in relation to the work. They were found in the margins of Lenin's copy of one of Deborin's chapters, printed in 1909 in advance of the full work. Lenin was greatly given to writing comments in margins, and among the remarks with which he sprinkled Deborin's chapter, were comments such as inexact, clumsy, fibs, and ni plus ultra of clumsiness. There is only one favorable comment, which simply says right, next to an underlined passage. Unquote. Quote, the objection was that Deborin takes over from Plehanov precisely what is least valuable in him, his apology for Feuerbach, the application of Feuerbach's anthropological principle to epistemology, the discounting of Lenin's theory of knowledge, the so-called copy theory, also known as the theory of reflection, the attempt to solve the epistemological problem of the subject-object relation in terms of purely metaphysical categories, without regard for historical and revolutionary reality, the whole non-political and unrevolutionary spirit of Deborin's philosophy resembles that of Plehanov's. Unquote. I'll quickly say about Feuerbach that, although Feuerbach was a great philosopher and a materialist, who even later became a socialist, his views on the theory of knowledge, on ethics and politics, suffered from idealism. But let's continue. Quote, Elsewhere, in his introduction to volume 9 of Lenin's selected works, Deborin modifies his opinion to some extent, maintaining that Lenin and Plehanov represented different stages in the development of Marxism. He says, There is a difference between Plehanov and Lenin which reflects what is peculiar to historical phases of development in the revolutionary movement and the class struggle of the proletariat. To this, the Marxist-Leninist objected that the most important works of Plehanov and Lenin, and not only the philosophical ones, but also others, such as the polemic against the Narodniks, belong to the same period. Another well-known Deborinist therefore deals with the question in a rather different fashion. In an article in the magazine Potsnamen in Marxisma, he writes, Plehanov and Lenin are representative not of different periods in the workers' movement, but of different currents in it and in Marxism, a different type of insight into the same thing. But even this approach found no acceptance from the Marxist-Leninist point of view, 
To speak of different currents and tendencies in Marxism is to abandon Marxism-Leninism. It would mean reverting to the standpoint of the Second International, which locked down Marxism as an agglomeration of movements, tendencies, etc. Unquote. Then, let's talk about de Borin's position on the unity and struggle of opposites, which is an important principle of dialectics. Vetter writes, quote, The mechanists were accused in their day of having interpreted the negation of the negation to signify a restoration of equilibrium. Buharin, for example, thought of synthesis not as the negation of the negation, but as a reconciliation of opposites. Buharin says in Historical Materialism that synthesis is a, quote, unifying position in which contradictions are reconciled, unquote. The same objection was also brought against Menshevizing idealism. De Borin, for example, having seen in dialectical materialism a reconciliation of empiricism and rationalism, unquote. There were some empiricists who were materialists, such as Locke and Hobbes, and some who were idealists, such as Berkeley, and there were rationalists, such as Spinoza, who were materialists, some who were in between, like Descartes, and then others who were idealists, such as Leibniz. But it is fundamentally erroneous to say that synthesis is some kind of a reconciliation of these two things. It's more retaining the progressive elements of the contradiction and developing them further and discarding the outdated elements. Actually, I think I may have mentioned this in the previous episode, but Lenin's critique of uh, Plehanov when it comes to dialectics is that Plehanov didn't understand the significance of contradiction and struggle in dialectics. He only saw the unity, but not the struggle of opposites. In uh, the philosophical notebooks, Lenin said something like, Beltov, which was a pseudonym of uh, Plehanov, has written like a thousand pages on philosophy and there's nothing on the contradiction of opposites. But let's keep going. Quote, Mitin makes a further objection to de Borin that the latter's view of dialectic represents a reconciliation of opposites, not a struggle between them. In discussing Kant's antinomies, de Borin writes, Kant opposed the thesis to the antithesis and attempts to show that the thesis excludes the antithesis and hence that they cannot be reconciled or resolved. The positive dialectic, on the other hand, sees in thesis and antithesis opposites which are not mutually exclusive but reconciled with one another, unquote. Which is a really stupid thing to say because the whole point of dialectics is that the opposites are mutually exclusive, but they're still in a unity. The whole problem with Kant was that he didn't understand how that could be possible. He thought that they either have to be mutually exclusive or united, but they're both. But credit should be given to Kant for pointing out this problem, so that then Hegel, who came after, was able to develop dialectics and solve it. Mitin contrasts this view of dialectic with that of Lenin, according to which it is not the unity, but the opposition, which plays the primary role in the dialectic. The unity of opposites is relative, temporary, transient, whereas the conflict between mutually exclusive opposites is absolute, like the development of movement itself." Unquote. Now, let's make a little summary of what uh, Menshevizing idealism is and what this whole thing was about. Quote, To sum up, we may say that Menshevizing idealism is condemned firstly as an idealistic tendency in that it offers too many hostages to Hegelianism, adopts the Hegelian dialectic without transforming it materialistically, separates form and content, and misconceives the nature of matter. Secondly, as a Menshevizing tendency, in that it represents a revival of the traditions of the Second International, separates theory from practice, philosophy from politics, failing thereby to practice partisanship in philosophy, overestimates Plehanov, and underestimates the importance of Lenin in the development of philosophy. Unquote. And while that is perhaps not a perfect definition of it, and actually Gustav Vedder himself was an idealist and a reactionary, so I'm a bit surprised how well he uh, explained it, but I think that is a pretty good quote because it lists so many different aspects of it, so many points that they discussed. So what was the result and uh, aftermath of the debate? Quote, Since the above-mentioned condemnation of Menshevizing idealism by the party Central Committee, 25th of January 1931, de Borin, having acknowledged his errors, has been able thereafter to occupy leading positions in the scientific work of the USSR. In November 1935, he was elected secretary of the Social Sciences Division of the Academy of Sciences. 
1938, we find him on the Council of the Philosophical Institute of the same Academy of Sciences, while in 1939, he was elected to the Presidium of the Academy itself. At present, which means uh, in the early 1950s when this book was written, De Borin is a member of the editorial board of the Vesnik, the official organ of the Academy of Sciences of the USSR, unquote. Mitin and his collaborators also received some criticism in the mid-1930s for not keeping up with the development of the political situation, but despite this, Mitin was considered a leading Marxist-Leninist philosopher, quote, On the occasion of his nomination to ordinary membership of the Academy of Sciences in 1939, Mitin's services to Soviet philosophy were appraised by the Vesnik of the Academy as follows. Mitin is one of the foremost researchers in the field of philosophy. For the past ten years, he has been engaged in investigating the problems of dialectical materialism and of the history of philosophy. Among the deepest inquiries devoted to the problems of dialectical materialism are works such as his Burning Questions of Materialist Dialectics, Engels and Dialectical Materialism, Materialist Dialectic, The Philosophy of the Proletariat, and Stalin and the Materialist Dialectic. As regards the history of philosophy, particular importance attaches to those works of Mitten, which outline the interrelation of ideas between Marxism and classical German philosophy, more especially the philosophy of Hegel. Hegel and the materialist dialectic, Hegel's history of philosophy, Hegel's philosophy of right. Translations of a number of Hegel's greatest works are appearing under M. B. Mitten's editorship, Science of Logic and History of Philosophy. In combination with his scholarly activities, Mitten pursues a thoroughgoing campaign against mechanist and idealist theories in the field of philosophy. In addition to his academic work, Mitten displays great activity as a lecturer and publicist. He is in charge of the philosophical and socio-political journal under the banner of Marxism and is at present director of the Marx-Engels-Lenin Institute." Unquote. In this video I have discussed and criticized Plehanov and De Borin at great length, and I think these days De Borin is pretty well known, but he's not super well known, and I think a lot of people only know the name of De Borin because of what Mao said about him in uh, On Contradiction. But I want to re-emphasize that Plehanov was a great theoretician, and Lenin praised some of his philosophical and theoretical works highly. Certain works of Plehanov, such as The Development of the Monist View of History and The Role of the Individual in History, are classics of Marxism. In other words, it is good and useful to read and study Plehanov. But Plehanov still failed to understand certain aspects of dialectics and made serious opportunist mistakes in politics, so his work must be read critically. And it is infinitely useful to read what Lenin has to say about Plehanov. De Borin also wrote many good works, and I also encourage people to study De Borin. But needless to say, he also made many mistakes, some of which were serious and some of which were not so serious. But hopefully this video can serve as a at least a rough guide to avoid many of them. But as Lenin said, it goes without saying that nobody can be blamed for making mistakes and that the problem is only when one chooses to persist in the mistakes. And lastly, I also recommend uh, reading the work of uh, M. B. Mitten. He's not nearly as well known, but a lot of it is good stuff, and I will add a link in the description to uh, some of his work that I've been able to find.